Hi everyone, it's John. Another week, another book review for you guys. Last week I was scrolling through my Goodreads reviews and simultaneously scrolling through my YouTube uploaded reviews and had noticed for whatever reason one of the reviews I had written I had actually not filmed and uploaded. I thought I did and maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I actually did and for some reason, whatever that could have been, the cover art on the novel or whatever, maybe uh, it was taken down, maybe it was flagged. I was I was never uh, warned if that was the case. But I noticed that my review of Somerset Mom's novel, Cakes and Ale, never made it to YouTube. So I want to rectify that now and get it up here because it's uh, one of the few five-star, what I gave it on Goodreads for whatever that's worth, novels that I've read this year. So this is a Cakes and Ale, uh, written in, I believe, 1930, published in 1930? Yes, 1930, uh, by W. Somerset Maugham, the great English novelist. Shakespeare put into the mouth of Sir Tobe Belch the words that gave this book its title, which are these words, Dost thou think, because thou art virtuous, there shall be no more cakes and ale. Unfortunately, I get the distinct impression that Somerset Maugham is remembered today as one of those old, stodgy writers of that virtuous school. That's always the first impression I had before reading the first mom novel that I ever read, which was The Razor's Edge. And um, and I guess with, with that and maybe one other, those are the only two or three uh, uh, mom novels I've read, uh, that novel did a lot to brush away the sort of Victorian cobwebs that I associ associated with his work. With Cakes and Ale, he's proven that he's really a, a, a unique literary craftsman, unafraid to rub up against the crusty social traditions of his time. Basically the, the exact opposite as the writer I had sort of assumed him to be, mostly because of when he was writing. This book perhaps hits the reader the hardest when they realize that one of the main themes which is social propriety inside of a marriage, is still one whose Victorian past lingers on. Marriage denotes for the vast majority of people lifelong monogamy, not to mention exclusivity when it comes to feelings of love. These are not the assumptions of the formerly illustrious and now demode writer Edward Driffield and his first wife, the dashing and inspirational muse named Rosie, Edward doesn't seem to know that Rosie is pretty much the town pump. That's only a little bit of an understatement, a little bit of an overstatement, but it's clear that she finds, let's just say, company outside of her marriage, and does so eh, rather frequently. The novel is somewhat ambiguous about the degree to which Edward knows about this, but uh, she eventually up and just leaves him one day, and Edward is forced to move on with his life. The novel begins at a much later date, after Edward has long since remarried and passed away. His second wife, Amy Driffield, full of that sort of old-fashioned Victorian Edwardian propriety and everything that Rosie wasn't, wants only to cement her husband's literary reputation by getting someone to write his biography. And this is when the third-rate hack writer Alroy Keir, who, despite his admiration for Edward's work, has none of its charm and brilliance, shows up. Keir has been commissioned to write the story of Edward's life and goes about looking for someone who's known Edward for many years. And that's when he stumbles on Ashenden, who is the narrator of the novel. 
From here, the novel proceeds as a series of carefully choreographed flashbacks of Ashenden detailing what he knows of Driffold's early life and his friendship with the Driffolds. They seemed to be kind, warm people, despite the constant company and attention that Edward Driffold's work drew. Uh, after several years of growing attached to them, one day they simply up and skipped town, leaving several creditors unpaid, only to run into them later and get reacquainted just as Edward is becoming pretty well known for his work. Years after Rosie leaves Driffle for another man and everyone writes her off as dead, Ashington tracks her down, and even though she's pretty old by now, uh, she still re retains every bit of her youthful charm. She tells him of a tragic story of miscarrying one of Edward's children and the one-night affair that she had to cope with all of the pain that it caused her. And this is the one secret that he refuses to share with Amy and Keir. In the 1950 edition of Cakes and Ale, put out by Modern Library, Mom said, I'm willing enough to agree with the common opinion that Of Human Bondage is my best work, but the book I like the best is Cakes and Ale because in its pages lives for me again the woman with a lovely smile who was the model for Rosie Driffield. It really is a Rosie of a book, one that loves widely and openly, asks for a little in return, and hopefully one that inspires creativity and wonderment in everyone who reads it. Cakes and Ale is really nothing short of a, a tale of memory and love, and a philosophical exploration of the relationship between writers and their audience. Ultimately, though, it's a pie into creativity of uh, being a writer and the freedom and liberty that one gains through it. In the last chapter of the book, Ashenden reminisces, The writer's life is full of tribulation. First, he must endure poverty and the world's indifference, then, having achieved a measure of success, he must submit to a good grace of its hazards. He depends upon a fickle public. He is at the mercy of journalists who want to interview him, and photographers who want to take his picture, of editors who harry him for copy, and tax gatherers who harry him for income tax, of persons of quality who ask him to lunch, and secretaries of institutes who ask him to lecture, of women who want to marry him, and women who want to divorce him, of youths who want his autograph, of actors who want parts, and strangers who want a loan, of gushing ladies who want advice on their matrimonial affairs, and earnest young men who want advances for their compositions, of agents, publishers, managers, bores, admirers, critics of his own conscience. But he has one compensation. Whatever, whenever he has anything on his mind, whether it be a harassing reflection, Grief at the death of a friend, unrequited love, wounded pride, anger at the treachery of someone to whom he has shown kindness. In short, any emotion or any perplexing thought, he has only to put down in black and white, using it as the theme of a story or the decoration of an essay, to forget all about it. He is the only free man. Writer as the only free man, the author is the only free man, especially the, the writer of fiction. It's an interesting idea. Uh, Cakes and Ale. Really, um, I, I, I loved Razor's Edge, but I loved this even more. So um, it will strike a lot of people as dated and a bit of, even though it was written in, the in 1930, it will strike people as a bit of a, sort of a Victorian-esque late 19th century novel, but uh, the themes that it touches on and the way that the characters are, are built up and shown uh, are just pretty much unforgettable for me. Somerset Mom's Cakes and Ale. Let me know if you've read it and if you have what you think about it. I will see you next week, guys. Bye.